What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So hopefully you had a good weekend overall, especially if it was like a holiday weekend for you. Had a lot of fun here. I actually started that GameCube collection up. I think we're gonna do a series for it and hopefully I'll have another one in the series in, in like a month or two for you guys. But it was a lot of fun to go through them and I've actually been playing the GameCube quite a bit now just because of that, because I have all these new games to play, so pretty cool stuff there. Today, though, we have a bunch of stuff to go over because it looks like there were some job listings for Breath of the Wild 2 that are uh, a bit confusing for a lot of people to look at. I'm actually gonna go over what, what I think they mean and what's going on there, and then also we found out how long Fire Emblem appears to be, and, uh, Seems like it's gonna take a while. Like you're gonna get your $60 worth if you're really a fan of the Fire Emblem series or if you're looking for a longer RPG to play. As always guys, enjoy these videos. Make sure you hit the like button, it really helps out. And get subscribed as we go forward here so you can keep up to date on all the gaming news that's going on 8 a.m. Eastern time every weekday morning. I've got you guys right here. Uh, we're actually gonna start today with a bit of a look at what happened at the uh, gathering of the shareholders. Now, of course, Nintendo does this every year. I believe this is the 79th one. They always ask them a bunch of questions about the Switch, current business dealings, all kinds of stuff. Well, President Furukawa was actually asked specifically about how they're going to compete when the power gap continues to grow between what we assume to be the PlayStation 5 and the next Xbox in that scarlet kind of code name. And this is actually what he said. We consider our hardware install base to be a particularly important factor for publishers who are deciding whether to release software on our platforms. Therefore, we believe that our primary focus is to increase the hardware install base, generate momentum, and create an environment where publishers can supply their titles with confidence. So essentially, what they're saying is we want to build this install base to this massive number, right? Which multiple SKUs in the family or of devices like a Switch Mini, a Switch Pro, whatever you want to call the a new Switch. Uh, those are things that would help to increase that install base because if they do say get to the 3DS numbers, which were like, you know, 70 to 80 million, at that point, the PlayStation 5 and the next Xbox will be restarting. And yes, you will have an advantage there because you will still probably just get games just because your install base is so large, especially when those ones have to restart and rebuild. Yes, they'll have backwards compatibility. I get that. So PS4 games will work forward. So you'll probably have developers probably still develop just on PS4 and have like a PS5 patch, but the fact that Nintendo would have a large install base would help them negotiate with third parties. That seems to be what they're doing here. Strengthen numbers, and then I guess eventually they'll restart too with the Switch, again, two or whatever the next thing they call it. Also, if you're a Batman fan, we did have a listing on Amazon UK that appears to point to a collection of the Batman games. Now, of course, we had Batman Return to Arkham, which was like a collection of Arkham City and uh, Arkham Asylum. And now, of course, we have Arkham Knight, and it looks like Amazon UK UK actually posted a listing for the collection that appears to include all three of them. Now, I don't know if there'll be any extra features to it or benefits when it comes to like the Xbox One X and everything or any of that. I believe the collection or the, the Return to Arkham was already benefiting somewhat from the Xbox One X. It was enhanced in some way, but maybe they have something else up their sleeve for it. I would like to think they're doing a collection just to have everything thrown into one SKU or one game because I feel like Rocksteady's working on something other than Batman or Superman or any of that stuff, at least from what they've said they are. But I guess keep an eye out if you're looking to pick up all of them at once rather than buy them individually now. Might be worth waiting till I guess this fall at least is when Amazon UK said it'd be coming out. Oh, and we had an interview with the Luigi's Mansion 3 developers and GameSpot and they talked a bit about the length of the game, go figure, we're now hearing about how long something like Fire Emblem is, how long Luigi's Mansion 3 is. Sounds like there's gonna be 17 floors part of this hotel, and at one point you will be able to explore all of them. We talked about that previously in another news wave, but 17 floors, and they were also asked about DLC or post-release content, and it sounds like they're not that interested in doing that, mostly because they say that they would have told an entire story just based on the, the game when it releases, and that there's no real need to go back considering the hotel is already built how it is and there's not much there to add to the story. As in, they're looking to release a full game, a complete game, and then kind of move on from there. No need to continue releasing stuff for it when they could possibly be working on the next Luigi's Mansion the next Mario Strikers. <laughs> this, I actually like that idea and that that look to say, hey, we're it's complete, there's plenty of stuff there, and we're gonna move on. However, other games that, like a Mario Party, that one probably could have used some post content, but, but I, I think there is a bit of a difference here between something like Mario Party and Luigi's Mansion 3, and I do like that it sounds like it's feature-packed and plenty of content, so good looks there, definitely looking forward to it. 
Hopefully it makes that October, we think, release window. We'll see. And guys, some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. We're actually gonna start with Digimon. I know it seems weird to start with Digimon, but there was actually a lot of talk about the Digimon video game series this past weekend at Anime Expo, where Bandai actually talked quite a bit about their plans going forward, calling it the future of Digimon, where they actually talked a bit about Digimon Survive, which appears to be getting pushed to 2020, which we haven't heard too much about it, so I'm not too surprised to hear that. But then we hear a bit more about Digimon Cyber Sleuth. Do you remember that series? It was on, uh, I, know, I remember playing it on the Vita. I know it was on the PS4 and the Vita kind of simultaneously. I remember getting the second one on the Vita. However, at this panel, they actually talked a bit about a complete edition. And this complete edition will actually be coming to the Nintendo Switch and PC. And it's going to include the original, of course, Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth, and then Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth Hacker's Memory. And it's actually coming out later on on this year and this is actually a pretty cool thing to see. It's gonna be releasing October 18th and to see this happen and show up on the Switch is cool but also on the PC, there's not a lot of Digimon stuff on the PC from what I remember. It's it's it, That was a PlayStation exclusive for the most part and it looks like they're looking to expand it a bit to widen their audience appeal and of course they have Digimon Survive for next year. So why not? work towards the re the other audience with the PC and the Switch. And of course the Switch is taking over massively in Japan. So yeah, why wouldn't you move it over to, let's be real, it's essentially the new Vita. So th that makes sense. Uh, it's good to see that. These were pretty good games. So. I played the second one extensively. The first one, an okay amount. I will say it is a very traditional feeling RPG, JRPG, and it is kind of grindy, but if you really enjoy Digimon, you'll actually get a kick out of this game. I think it definitely works better as a handheld game and playing it on the Vita and uh, playing it with a friend when they had it on their PS4, I can tell you it, it is a better handheld game and I got more time out of it on the Vita, but really cool to see that. They also say that a new Digimon story game, which I guess would fall fall on the lines of the, uh, sli the Cyber Sleuth series, not necessarily Digimon Survive, is also in the works. So it sounds like there's a lot of stuff going on for Digimon. It, it kind of feels like Digimon's on a bit of an upswing right now. You'll have to let me know if, if maybe I'm imagining that. It just, it feels like there's a lot more going on with Digimon now than I remember ever bit. Well, not ever, because obviously in like the late 90s, it was pretty popular around the time Pokemon was going on. But still, now it seems like there's just more stuff going on with Digimon. So interesting stuff there, and it'll be cool to see that complete edition released towards the end of October. Next up, let's talk about Fire Emblem Three Houses out at the end of this month. It's only a few weeks away, and people are getting pretty excited for it, especially, of course, Fire Emblem fans who have been waiting for, I, I would assume, a, another console version of the game for a little while. It's been on the 3DS, of course, and I do remember it, of course, on the Wii and the GameCube, but here we are now rolling into Fire Emblem Three Houses, and there was some some questioning about how long this game would be. Well, in an interview with Jacques Video, this is actually what they had to say when developers talked to him. To complete the game with just one of the three houses, it took me 80 hours. I did not skip the dialogue or cutscenes, of course, so if you want to do the three paths, it can take you more than 200 hours. That is an obscene amount of time, but that's not, that's pretty good. Like for $60, you get 200 hours out of it. Now, I am curious how different the three paths are from each other. Like, is it just like completely different? Or is it, I guess, technically the same storyline, but you have different characters? I mean, it sounds like you also kind of build up your characters how you want as well. So it, it sounds like there's just a lot of replayability to it. But if you get different looks at the story from different angles when you're playing through different house paths and everything, that is insane. I, that is a very long game. I'm I'm excited to jump into Fire Emblem. It's been a little while. I like I, I played with it a little bit on the 3DS when Awakening came out, but before that, I, I guess the last time I played it really was on the Wii when I rented it at one point, and even then I didn't get as into it. Uh, so I'm I'm interested to check it out here, see what the game is like. Three houses, at least the idea of three different houses that you play through and you pick one, I guess, to play through in the beginning is kind of interesting to me. So. So looking forward to it. I've definitely become more of a fan of strategy-based RPGs over the years. So I think I'm gonna jump into this and get a lot out of it and I'm looking forward to it. Next up, let's talk about 
I'm not even kidding, Pokemon Snap 2. Now, of course, a lot of emphasis right now in Pokemon is on Sword and Shield. Makes sense, it's the next game coming up. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of controversy around it, but one game that people seem to always bring up, specifically older gamers that I see, is a new Pokemon Snap of some kind, whether it's a direct sequel or a spin-off or just something that has to do with that gameplay where you're essentially taking pictures of Pokemon in the natural habitat and then you get points and stuff where you can throw pester balls or just apples at them and just ruin their day, but Masuda was actually asked about Pokemon Snap 2 and why we haven't seen one in an interview with Metro saying, all I can say is that I don't think we could just make the same thing again. So we'd have to come up with a very unique twist on this if we, could, if we do make another one. So they don't seem to have any obvious plans. They say we can't make the same thing. And to a degree, they're probably right. Like if you go back and play Pokemon Snap now, I don't know if they'd be able to take that exact same formula, move it over to now, like, you know, 2020. Let's pretend like, oh, it's coming out next year, 2020, and they'd be able to sell it for $60. I don't think that would work. I think the on-rail system would have to change. I think it would have to be kind of free roaming and it would be an interesting thing to see. I also think most of us look at that Labo VR, see the camera, what do we all immediately think? We all immediately think Pokemon Snap too, right? That, like that's what we think. But would they be able to integrate it into that correctly and have it make sense again and be a $60 game? Most likely, no. It would have to have something else to it. And that's kind of what they're struggling with here. I think a lot of us want Pokemon Snap in some capacity, but I also think a lot of us remember Pokemon Snap when it was on the N64 and have, again, some nostalgia glasses for it. I wouldn't mind seeing them if they ever get back to N64 games like they kind of started to do, obviously, on the Wii U, where I believe Pokemon Snap came out there and everything and people got really excited. If we even just got that version and it came over and we we're like, OK, guys, here's Pokemon Snap from the N64. It's, you know, 15 bucks. Go to town. I think at least then people would be happy. But I do still think there is a need for Pokemon Snap 2. It was such a cool idea at the time. It was so different and weird. And that's, I think, kind of what we're missing nowadays. It, a lot of games now feel kind of status quo. I miss the weird spin-off type games like a Pokemon Snap. So yes, I'm, I'm in for a sequel, but I guess change it up somewhat to be more modern. In our last bit of news, let's talk a bit about Breath of the Wild 2 and some new job recruitment pages that have gone up for, uh, for Nintendo and everything, specifically talking about different roles in game development for people to be contributing with. Of course, getting hired as contractors, it appears, and contributing. And a few of the things have to do with uh, 3D modeling and working towards things like terrain, for example. One job listing appears to be a level designer. It seems to be one for a contract position, and it seems to deal with things like dungeons and events. And this has people a bit concerned, and here's why, because it looks like they're just starting to work on the dungeons and the events. I don't think that's the case, mostly because one person wouldn't necessarily be hired to do all of that. Most likely, someone may have quit midway through or had to move on or got promoted or, or moved out of that position to another one, and they need somebody to fill in. A contractor would be someone that would come in temporarily, right? They have a contract, and when it's up, you're basically done. In this case, it seems like they're bringing some people in to kind of help uh, development along faster rather than just get started now. In fact, I actually look at this as being a positive for, I'm not kidding, a 2020 release for Breath of the Wild 2. I still think that's a thing. I, I think this year is pretty much locked up, obviously. Some people were thinking it might like randomly release in 2019. I, I don't think so, no. I, I think this is a 2020 release. I think they have it planned out for that. And then I think 2021 is gonna be the year for Metroid Prime 4 to drop and then probably some other games in development that we don't know about. I mean, I could see 2020 having Bayonetta 3 and something like Breath of the Wild 2 in that same holiday season with probably another Pokemon game, of course, and then a few others. So interesting stuff there. But when you see these job listings and you hear about how it sounds like they're working now in the dungeons, which hopefully they're traditional dungeons, by the way, I would like to see Breath of the Wild take a different spin from the first Breath of the Wild so that can stand on its own and not get overshadowed by the second one for using the same ideas. But I actually think it's just to speed up development. I think they want to hit that 2020 release and this is a good way to do it. And we'll finish up today with the comment of the day. This one's actually from Ricky saying, if the xCloud box is able to do what you're hoping it does at a $100 price point with $15 game pass, I might actually get an Xbox machine for the first time ever. So you're gonna have to deal with game streaming, right? We, we've talked about some of the issues there, but 
I think if they can get this price under $100, like 99 is the obvious one for uh, psychological buying and everything. Impulse buying is what they want with this streaming box. That's why things like uh, Amazon's Fire Sticks do so well because they move those for $35 to $40. Doesn't feel like a massive spend to get that thing. And I think if Microsoft can figure out how to do that here, then they'll be onto something. But the problem they have run into is that the controllers are like 50 bucks. So even if you can get that little, little piece down to like $30, it's still like an $80 thing. So I guess that would be their, probably their low point is like 80 bucks. But if they can just get it underneath a hundred, I think they'll get impulse buyers like yourself. And of course they'll tack on Game Pass for a free month or something. And then they have them, you know, that's how you get them in that streaming service. And that's why I think Microsoft has the clear advantage over Stadia because they have the library, they have the, uh, the Game Pass service that they can tie in. And to be honest, they have the notoriety with their just, I mean, look at Xbox and their controller and stuff. So yeah, a lot of that is working towards Microsoft's favor right now with the xCloud. They just gotta get that thing released. Like, when is it even coming out? Ladies and gentlemen, let's go do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit the like button, really helps out. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about today, whether it's the Breath of the Wild 2 job listings that appear to talk about level designers, uh, people to do 3D modeling with terrain and others. Do you think these are ways for them to speed up development, or do you think they really are just getting started on some of this stuff, and this is like a 2021 release? Let me know what you think about that one down below. I'm, I'm very curious to see where people's timelines are for Breath of the Wild 2, not for story, but for like actual development. What do you think about Fire Emblem being 200 hours long if you want to do everything? Seems to be 80 hours just for one path, but some people think sometimes games are too long and it's actually, you kind of fall out of them. But let me know what you think about that for the length of the game. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.